Francesco Petrarch, son of the Florence citizen of Europe. Petrarch was unique for his day. He had a really a pan-European citizenship. He lived in many places. He traveled to many more. But one of these places that he'd never lived and very rarely traveled to was Florence. However, he's perhaps as Florentine as any other artist who comes from Florence. How can we have this one figure, Petrarch, who both represents Florence and really never lived in Florence? Petrarch was born in Arezzo. His dad was exiled, exiled at the same time that Dante Alighieri's dad was exiled in 1301. He lived and studied in Prato, near Florence. The family moved to Bologna, Montpellier. Petrarch lived in Avignon, in France, at the papal court, in Parma, in the Vaucluse, in Provence, in Padua, in Venice, in Milan. He was welcomed as a guest and hosted by the greatest lords throughout Europe. He visited Rome, invited as a special guest of the Senate to receive the laurel crown. He was a special guest at the court of Anjou in Naples. He saw the coast of Spain. He might have even traveled to England. He was sent as an imperial ambassador to Prague. He went to Paris. Many other cities hosted Petrarch in his life, but not Florence. But still, Florence and Petrarch go together. Petrarch is the ambassador of Florentine culture in the world. There is one moment that Florence welcomed Petrarch, and that was in 1350, passing through Tuscany on his way to Rome, Boccaccio invites him to stop by, and they meet, but outside the gates of Florence. So it's fitting that we talk about Petrarch here, just a little bit outside of the city, because although Petrarch culturally, ancestrally, is a son of Florence, he never really lived in this town. Yet at the same time, he represented Florence and Florentine culture to all the European world and to our world today. What is it that makes Francesco Petrarch, or Petrarca as we call him, so Florentine, even though he never lived in this city and seemed to reject it in many different ways? The answer can be found in his poetry, in his Italian poetry, because Petrarch was a man divided, divided between his Latin erudite writings and his vulgar or vernacular or Italian writings. While excellent in both and influential through the ages, it is his poetry, his vernacular poetry, that has stood the test of time and marks him as a particularly Florentine artist. Petrarch wrote a lot of poetry, and he spent his, li he spent his life rewriting, reorganizing his poetry. And what comes of that is a collection of poetry that doesn't include all the poetry he wrote, but is the most important bits of pieces of his poet, poetry, which we call now today the canzoniere, or the songbook. Modeled somewhat after Dante, although Petrarch would never want to hear that said, it creates a story, a story based on the meeting of a young woman named Laura, Laura, in April of 1327 in France. This Laura becomes a symbol for Petrarch through the whole collection of poems on which he continually reappraises himself as a poet. Laura can mean a number of things if you think of her as an allegorical figure, much like Beatrice is allegorical for Dante. Laura, the soft wind that blows through the trees. Laura, the laurel crown that Petrarch desires to wear. Fame, something Petrarch is always searching for in his poetry. Petrarch's Italian poetry is the most exquisite expression of the Italian vernacular to date. Poets since Petrarch have modeled their language on Petrarch's poetry. It's the standard by which all Italian poetry is judged. And in this, Petrarch is the head of the school of Tuscan poets, even ahead of Dante in terms of the beauty and art of his poetry. I'd like to read a few of the poems that Petrarch wrote in translation, unfortunately, for you in this beautiful spot outside of Florence, in a garden, 
much like the garden in which Petrarch met Laura those many years ago. It is clear from the outset of the Canzoniere that these 366 poems are not about his love for Laura, but are about his own construction of identity and thought through his poetic vocation and the poetic process. Listen to the first poem, which he calls a palinode, or a retraction of the 365 poems that will follow. You who hear in scattered rhymes the sound of those sighs with which I nourished my heart during my first youthful error, when I was in part another man from what I am now. For the varied style in which I weep and speak between vain hopes and vain sorrow, where there is anyone who understands love through experience, I hope to find pity, not only pardon. But now I see well how for a long time I was the talk of the crowd, for which often I am ashamed of myself within. And of my raving, shame is the fruit, and repentance, and a clear knowledge that whatever pleases in the world is a brief dream. Let's move to another poem where we can see Petrarch fighting with these same struggles within himself to find peace where there is love. Number 134. Peace I do not find, and I have no wish to make war. And I fear and hope, and burn, and am of ice. And I fly above the heavens, and I lie on the ground. And I grasp nothing, and embrace all the world. One has me in prison who neither opens nor locks, neither keeps me for his own, nor unties the bonds. And love does not kill, and does not unchain me. He neither wishes me alive, nor frees me from the tangle. I see without eyes, and I have no tongue, and yet cry out, and I wish to perish, and I ask for help, and I hate myself and love another. I feed on pain, weeping I laugh. Equally displeasing to me are death and life. In this state I am, lady, on account of you. This movement between pain and pleasure, love and hate, is a hallmark of the Tuscan poetic tradition, not just Dante, but Guido Cavacanti, Guido Cunicelli, and others. This is the Petrarch at his most Florentine. Here in this poem that will come, a canzone, longer, so I'll only read a short part of it, he shows his exquisite, exquisite poetic language, more formal, more curated than Dante's or other poets before him. This is the Italian that becomes the model for all Italian poetry throughout the Renaissance and beyond. Clear, fresh, sweet waters, where she who alone seems lady to me rested her lovely body. Gentle branch, where it pleased her, with sighing I remember, to make a column for her lovely side. Grass and flowers that her rich garment covered along with her angelic breast. Sacred bright air, where love opened my heart with her lovely eyes. Listen all together to my sorrowful, dying words. It is indeed my destiny and heaven will ex exert itself that love closes these eyes while they are still weeping. Let some grace bury my poor body among you and let my soul return naked to this its own dwelling. Death will be less harsh if I bear this hope to the fearful pass. For my weary spirit could never in a more restful port or a more tranquil grave flee my laboring flesh and bones. Notice the switch between the rest and peace he finds in seeing Laura, this woman, in this beautiful garden, and the desire for the soul to travel, to move. This is the tension that lives in the canzoniere, that lives in Petrarch, between a desire to return home, let's imagine Florence, the home he never knew, and his own desire to flee that which he loves, to find himself safe, in a solitary place. And this is the vagabond Petrarch that we're going to focus on next. But let me read one last poem of his that reflects on this desire for him to always move around, to leave and flee that which sometimes is most comforting and sometimes most painful. Once again, this is a longer poem, a canzone, so I'll only re read a short part of 129. From thought to thought, from mountain to mountain, love guides me. For I find every trodden path to be contrary to a tranquil life. If there is 
Some solitary slope, a river or spring, or between two peaks, a shady valley, there my frightened soul is quieted. And as love leads it on, now it laughs, now weeps, now fears, now is confident. And my face, which follows wherever my soul leads, is clouded and made clear again, and remains but a short time in any one state. And at the sight, anyone who had experienced such a life would say, this man is burning with love and his state is uncertain. It is true, this is the uncertainty of, of a man who is born in exile, who has no home, is constantly searching from mountain to mountain, from thought to thought. Petrarch moves and we follow him. Petrarch's poetry is indeed beautiful, an incredible expression of the Italian tradition coming through Dante. But what about that other Petrarch, the one who re rejected Florence, who didn't want to be in this town, this is the Petrarch who was the ambassador of the Renaissance, the ambassador of even Florentine culture in the world. And this is the Petrarch of his Latin revival works. Petrarch, more than any other scholar in the Middle Ages or even Renaissance, was the author of the idea of the Renaissance, of the rediscovery of the classical tradition. And while Michelangelo Bunaleschi did it in art and architecture, Petrarch was the first doing it through literature, traveling the world, traveling Europe, monasteries, churches, libraries, in search of lost texts, finding texts by Ovid, by Cicero that no one had seen before, and identifying them as classical texts. This was the occupation of Petrarch, the Latin scholar, the rediscoverer of the beautiful classical tradition, the inventor of the Renaissance. And he did it himself as an author, Adopting classical styles, satire, the dialogue, the philosophical dialogue in a secretum. The epic poem written in Latin, the Africa, the secretum. His immense epistolary collection, letters written to famous people in the world, to which he was friends and counselor. Public documents like Ciceronian or orations. This is the Petrarch who rejected the parochial Florence and Italian tradition, opting to be a poet of the world, a poet of Europe. Nothing so encounters or embraces this passion that Petrarch had for a rediscovery of the classical world than his own effort to be crowned poet laureate, a tradition of the Roman period that died out in the third century. It, Petrarch himself, who reestablishes this tradition, and goes to Rome as the new poet laureate, the rebirth of the classical idea of secular poetry and art. Let's listen to what he says in his coronation oration. What is all this, my friend? Have you determined to revive a custom that is beset with inherent difficulty and has long since fallen into desuetude? And this in the face of a hostile and recalcitrant fortune? Whence do you draw such confidence that you would decorate the Roman capital with new and unaccustomed laurels? Do you not see what a task you have undertaken in attempting to attain the lonely steeps of Parnassus and the inaccessible grove of the Muses? Yes, I do see, O oh my dear sirs, I do indeed see this, O oh Roman citizens, for the intensity of my longing is so great that it seems to me sufficient to enable me to overcome all the difficulties that are involved in my present task. So dedicated is Petrarch to restoring and revitalizing this tradition that he asks himself these questions in his own uh, coronation ceremony. Why did you do it? And he does it to reach the heights of Mount Parnassus, to be with the muses and to create and re give new life to the tradition of the poet laureate, to the Roman traditions, to give birth, difficult as it sounds, to the Renaissance. It is this moment that we see the beginning of the revival of classical learning that will become the Renaissance in Florence.